I am somewhat of a, um, how would you say it, uh, a data geek when it comes to just strange facts. Jeopardy is my favorite TV show, you know, just a bunch of odd knowledge collected. So these stats may be a little bit outdated, but I wanted to share with you a few. So for instance, um, do you know that there are, on a dime, how many ridges there are on the outside of a dime? Okay, there's 118 of them on the outside of a dime. I didn't count them. I'm trusting the internet. (laughs) <laughs> with the truth of this, okay? Um, germs, the University of Arizona, I think it was, uh, yeah, found a, in a study that your office desk has up to 400 times more bacteria than a toilet seat, okay? You know, clean regularly. 3% of pet owners give their pets gifts on Valentine's Day. Barbie, the doll, her full name, Barbara Millicent Roberts. Did you know that? Okay. Um, there are 336 dimples on a golf ball. My dad counted one one time. That's the reason I know that one. Okay? But there's some other statistics that are a little bit more sobering. For instance, one out of every 350,000 Americans is going to get electrocuted in their life. Uh, Men are four times more likely to be struck by lightning than women. Uh, Each year, more Americans die in fires at home than all natural disasters combined. The leading cause of death for children between the ages of one and four is motor vehicle crashes. Every year, approximately 3,000 people choke to death. In the United States, you're more likely to be killed by a honeybee than a shark attack. That's comforting for us Midwesterners, right? Since 1978, at least 37 people have died as a result of shaking vending machines in an attempt to get free merchandise. And every year, approximately 2,500 left-handed people are killed by using objects or machinery designed for right-handed people. Now, those statistics, some of them make you laugh a little bit, but I've got a statistic that has not changed in thousands of years, and that's that one out of one people die. One out of one Americans dies. Every one of us is going to face that at some point. Now, we've been going through the book of Hebrews together, and we came to a passage that talked about some of the basic doctrines of the faith. And this is in Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, Verses 1 and 2, I'll read to you. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying a foundation, here's these doctrines, of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instruction about baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, the first four of those we've already covered in past weeks. We took a break for Palm Sunday and for Easter, but today we're going to combine the last two into one message about the resurrection of the dead and about eternal judgment. Now, for those of you who are long-termers here at Bethel, this message may ring a bell, but I figure after 12 years, it's okay to repeat. Okay, so this is one I did when I first came a number of years ago, but it bears repeating because it speaks specifically about those two topics, the resurrection of the dead and about eternal judgment. Now, I'm hoping that you grabbed a bulletin when you came in because inside of that bulletin, normally I have a half sheet in there. Today, it's a full color, eight and a half by 11 diagram that shows you what it is that happens after we die. And so I'd like you to follow along with that. If you didn't get one, um, raise your hand. And Kurt, are there a couple more back there? Okay, so you can go ahead. I think Michelle needs one. If anybody else needs one, let us know because it will be very, very helpful to follow along if you have the visual in front of you. And for those that are viewing online, if you look on the Facebook link, there is a, or the Facebook post there, there is a link where you can click to get this, have it up on your computer screen or maybe even print it out. Okay? So, what happens after we die? Well, what is death? Death is the separation of the spirit from the body. Okay, the body stops working, but your spirit lives on. Okay, that is the basic, but today we are going to go beyond the basics, but we're going to take it from the scriptures. We're not taking it from culture, we're not taking it from movies or from cartoons, okay, because those things often give us a twisted view of what happens in the afterlife. Now, what you're going to see on your diagram, the first thing is that there are two paths. Okay, you see on the diagram that there is a tombstone. When you die, on the left of that tombstone is one path. That's what we're all traveling right now. But when you get to the right of that tombstone, after you take your last breath, the path diverges. One goes up and one goes down. One towards heaven and one towards hell. Which one we take at death, which path we are on after death is determined by a decision that you make before death. And once you pass death, there is no changing that decision. 
The thing is, is none of us knows when we're going to die. So the whole point of this morning's message is the time to make that decision is right now. Because you do not know if you're even going to walk out of here this morning. You don't know when it's going to come. You need to be ready to make that decision. And that decision is whether or not you are going to accept or reject Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you the condensed version of what is called the gospel. We sang gospel music this morning, okay? It's a style of music, but it's not necessarily just because of the way that the notes are played or the the melodies, but it's because of the message that is in there. The gospel means good news, and the good news is good because the bad news is so bad. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard, which is 100% perfection 100% of the time. If you have ever sinned, you are not good enough to be with God. It's not that you need to measure up. It's to realize I am not good enough and to cry out to God, forgive me. Because Jesus came, he lived the perfect life that none of us did, but yet he still paid the penalty that all of us deserve for our sins. If you sin, you need to die. That's what God has said. Jesus never sinned, he died. And God said, since he died the death he didn't deserve, I will let his death count as payment for a sinful person. Actually, for any and for every sinful person who will place their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, you died for me. I confess my sin. I know I'm not good enough. Rescue me. So I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to live separate from you. He will come in. He will rescue you. And God will accept you, not because you're good enough, but because of what Jesus did for you. That is the message of the gospel. And that's the the decision that we all need to make before we die. After we die, we do not have that opportunity. Have you made that decision yet? The time to decide is now. Okay, so we're going to travel along this diagram. You see how there's two paths, one along the bottom, one along the top. We're going to start at the bottom, okay? The bottom first, where we're going to find out that there are two paths, okay? Two paths, and there's going to be a few things that might challenge your thinking this morning. The first one is this. Did you know that there are two hells? There is not just one, there are two, okay? Now, the first one, Let's look at now in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to go to uh, Luke chapter 16. Now I'm going to hopefully have these verses on the screens. We were having a little problems with our projector this morning, so I'm hoping these will be up for you, but I do encourage you to have your Bibles open. Luke chapter 16, and we're going to look start in verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. You see that there's two parts of this place in the afterlife. This is called Hades. Hades. Now, in our English Bibles, I I chose the New American Standard, which I usually preach from, because it actually translates that as Hades. Some of your Bibles will actually just say hell, okay? But there's a distinction. We'll learn about the second hell later. This is the first one, Hades. This place where you go in the afterlife. But if you notice, there are two parts. There's Hades proper, and then across a chasm, there is another place called Abraham's bosom or paradise it's sometimes called in other passages and so these two places the unrighteous go to Hades the righteous go to paradise after they die at least that's what it was before Jesus rose from the dead things have changed a little bit now after Jesus rose he actually took the righteous people from the paradise side and he emptied it emptied that side and took them up to heaven with him. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, uh, it gives a description of this, not in great detail, but it says this, therefore it says when he, this is referencing Jesus, ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. 
Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus, if you've heard in the Apostles' Creed, it says, you know, he was crucified, died, and was buried, and then he descended into hell. Okay, that's what it's referencing here. Hades is where he went. He went down there. We know he actually did, even did some preaching while he was down there, preaching to those who were disobedient. Because you see how there could be communication between the two sides, between the unrighteous and the righteous side, but there's no going from one to another. Once you die, you're destined for one or the other. But now that Jesus has risen from the dead, we know that the righteous don't go there anymore. Okay? We know that because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 6 through 8, Paul is talking about what happens after we die. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says this, Therefore, always being of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, that's alive here and now, okay, as long as we are at home, let's see, in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and would prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Where is the Lord Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Paul says, absent from the body is present with the Lord. Up there. Not down there. So, when a righteous person, now thinking righteous in Jesus Christ, not because we're good enough type of righteous, okay? If you've been made righteous in Jesus, if you die right now, you go up to be with Jesus in heaven. If you do not belong to Jesus, if he has never forgiven you of your sins, if you've never accepted his gift, you die, where do you go? Down to Hades, a place of torment, a place of agony, a place of fire right now, okay? Now, those are the two paths, but before we leave this part about the split between the two and what happens immediately after you die, we have to talk about one more thing, and that's about purgatory. Now, if you're familiar with purgatory, purgatory is a place where people go when they die if they've not been good enough to go to heaven yet, okay? And you are there to be purged. That's where they get the term purgatory, okay? Purged from your sin, okay? And so the people who are still alive here on earth can do good deeds and give money and stuff like that on your behalf to get you out of, out of purgatory and pop you up to heaven, okay? Now, there's a difference, though, between um, Hades and purgatory, okay? Hades is in the Bible. Purgatory is something man made up, and it's not true. I could see some of you were getting very concerned as I started to explain that. You're like, is he teaching about that? Yeah, purgatory is something that is not true. Absent from the body, where do you go? Present with the Lord or Hades. Purgatory is not real. Because you are not given, uh, um, sent to heaven because of your good deeds or anybody else's good deeds. It's only because of what Jesus did. So that doctrine, that's a primarily a Catholic doctrine, I think, about purgatory, just push that to the side because it's not true. But I had to correct that because of the fact that some of you may have been raised with that sort of idea, okay? So, um, now that we are done with the two paths, let's move on to the next section, okay? So on your diagram, you got that pink section. Now let's move on to this, the yellow section where it says two resurrections. Now we're going to start at the top of the diagram, okay, with the righteous. Um, now with the resurrection, that is the time opposite of what death is. Death is the separation of the spirit and the body. Resurrection is a time when spirit and body come back together, Okay, so right now we are living in, in, as embodied spirits. After we die, we are disembodied spirits. And then at the resurrection, we are going to be embodied again. We're going to have a body. Now, what is this body like? Okay, um, let's, well, I'm not going to talk so much about what it's like, but it is a better body. If you want to read about it, 1 Corinthians 15, whole chapter pretty much is on resurrection. It will tell you what the body is going to be like. I can tell you it's going to be a better one than you got now. All right? It's not going to be subject to, you know, arthritis and things falling apart and stopping working and all that. It is going to be an eternal body that you are going to be able to live in. It's going to be like Jesus' body that he has. It's human body 2.0, the upgraded version with all the bugs worked out. All right? So, now we can't nail down exactly when this is going to happen, when the resurrection is going to happen, but we are given some indications. So I can't point to it on a calendar, but... We do know that it does tie in with some other events. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm going to read you verses 15 to 18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, this is referencing Jesus, 
will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That means those who died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Your body is going to be reunited, or your spirit's going to be reunited with your body, okay, a new body, a recreated body, and then you, you as an embodied spirit are going to go up to meet Jesus, okay? That's if you have already died. Now, if you're still alive when Jesus comes back, which that'd be fantastic, okay, after those are raised, then the rest of us go up with him, okay, or with, with them. We meet Jesus, and then we're with Jesus for all of eternity, but what about those who are not followers of Jesus Christ? They also get raised, but at a different time and for a different purpose. All right? So let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, they did not receive the mark on their forehead and on their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, that's the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. First resurrection happens, then there's a thousand years of waiting. For the unrighteous, those who do not belong to Jesus, where are they? They are in Hades. And then after that thousand years are done, they are going to be raised. Now just as there are two resurrections, there are also going to be two judgments. And these two judgments are for very, very different purposes. Okay? So, these different purposes of the first one, we're going to start again at the top of your diagram. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. And there it talks about the judgment that we can anticipate as believers. Let's get to it. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, that word judgment seat, that is the Greek word bema. Okay, so in a uh, Greek society... If you came before the judge, you know, in our, we go into a courtroom nowadays, and the judge is usually seated up a little bit higher, kind of behind a desk. He's got his robe on, okay? Back then, a person was on a special seat called the bema. That's where the judge would sit. So the judge sits there. We are going to appear before the bema of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, to be recompensed or to be repaid for what we have done, whether good or bad. Now, when you think of this, do not think of a gavel, okay, where a judge slams that down and says guilty or not guilty or anything like that. It's not that kind of judgment. I want you to instead picture a medal stand in the Olympics when the people stand up there, okay? If you've got the person, you've got the three different levels, okay, which one of those people is getting punished? None of them. They are there for various levels of reward based on what they have done. When you stand before the Bema seat of Christ, you are not judged for the purpose of punishment. You are not judged based on, based on guilt or innocence because that was already taken care of at the cross when Jesus died. And you placed your faith in him, your innocence has already been declared. You are standing before him to be rewarded based on what you have done in your life. You know, a lot of rewards, a little bit of rewards, whatever it's going to be, that's what it is. This is a time of reward. Don't think punishment when you think Bema. Now, I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because there it describes what this Bema judgment is like. It doesn't use the term Bema, but it describes it, okay? 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. According to the grace of God which was given me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds. For no man can lay a foundation other than that one which was laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show itself because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. 
If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. If you've got the foundation of Jesus, you know you are passing through that judgment and coming out on the other side. The question is, are you carrying anything with you? A person saved through the fire? Sometimes people escape from a burning building with only their life to show for it. Sometimes their clothes even get burned off of them, right? They saved, but they've got nothing to show for it. When you come before the Bema seat of Christ, the works that you have done will be shown for what they are. If they are wood, hay, and straw, flammable, just earthly things, trying to achieve you know, success in this life and you know, building your own little kingdom and that kind of stuff, it's going to show because you can't take those on into eternity. But the things that you have done, which are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, those can survive the fire. Those will come out on the other side. You're witnessing for Christ. The sacrifices that you have made on his behalf, the kindness that you have done in his name for other people, those kind of things will survive the fire. They will come out on the other side. So when you think of the Bema, think rewards, not punishment. But when you think of the Bema, look at your life. Am I living a life that is going to be rewarded? Some people think it's like, oh, if I can just get to heaven, that'll be enough for me. I want to get to heaven with a whole bunch of rewards along with it when I get there. Be laboring for that which lasts on into eternity. Work for the rewards. So when you think Bema, think rewards. That's the judgment for the believer in Jesus Christ. What about the judgment for the unbeliever? Go down to the bottom of the diagram where you see that, that white throne there. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. We're going to go back there. It's just a little bit below where we were before. Revelation 20 is going to describe what this is like. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment is not a judgment for rewards. It is a judgment to determine guilt or innocence. And how is that determined? Each one was judged according to what? Their deeds. You are judged based on what you do. Because Jesus, or God's standard, is 100% perfection 100% of the time. It doesn't matter if you've done a bunch of good deeds. Have you ever done a bad deed? Have you ever done anything sinful? If so, you fall short of the standard. You are no longer perfect and you cannot pass through that judgment. So you will stand and be judged at the great white throne according to your deeds, unless you have trusted in somebody else's deeds on your behalf, in which case you will avoid this judgment. And once this judgment is pronounced, it will move on to sentencing. So let me ask this question. Are you ready to stand before God? Are you ready? In who, I, can, I can answer that question by asking you another question. In whose deeds are you standing? On whose deeds are you depending when you stand before God, your own or Jesus. That will determine what happens. Because if you are adjusting in your own deeds, you know, like the whole idea of those, those scales, well, my good deeds are going to outweigh my bad deeds. No, there's no scales there. You're either perfect or you're not. And if you're not, then it's time for sentencing. And what does the sentencing say? Well, it says that you are thrown into the lake of fire. We'll get to that in just a minute here, okay? So let's now jump up to the uh, two final destinies. I think that, Jerry, go ahead and go to the next slide here because I want to see which direction I'm going. Go ahead, next slide there. Can you go one more? Okay, I want to make sure that I was going the right direction here on my diagram, taking things in order. Okay, so for the person who believes and trusts in Jesus Christ, Revelation 21, 1 through 4, this is what we have to look forward to. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. They will be his people and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more uh, death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. Now, when we think of heaven, what do we usually say? Well, that person went up to heaven. I'm going up to heaven. I'll fly away, you know, like we talked about this morning, which is true if I die right now. My spirit's going away up there. But eternity, long term, where do we live? It's not up there. It's here. A new heaven and a new earth have been made. The holy city comes down. It's on earth established, and that's where we live with him. It is in a new heavenly city on a new earth. That, well, I don't know if it's a new heavenly city. It's the heavenly city on a new earth, and that's where we dwell with him for all of eternity. And what makes it heaven? It's not so much the streets of gold, the pearly gates, and all that kind of stuff. It's the fact that God am- will be among them. He, they will be his people, and he will be their God. And you'll find out if you go later in, in, uh, in the next chapter there that we actually get to see his face. We get to see God, which we can't do right now. That is heaven. That's what we have to look forward to. That is our final destiny for the person who believes in Jesus Christ. But for the unbeliever who has been declared guilty, it is time for sentencing. Now, you remember earlier on, I got some kind of quizzical looks when I said, there's two hells, all right? The first one was Hades, okay? And in our English Bible, that's translated hell. Oftentimes, too, there's another one that's translated hell, but it's a very different word. And that is the word Gehenna, Gehenna. Now, in in, uh, Palestine there, around Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem, there's a valley called the Valley of Hinnom, okay? And that's where this term comes from, Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was a place where people would throw the trash from the city. And there was always fires that were burning there to consume the trash. And it was a place, I mean, if you think of like what trash heaps are now or garbage dumps, okay, it's a place of rot and decay, But they would also burn things, but there's also worms and maggots and other things that are just decomposing. It's a nasty, nasty place, okay? That wasn't, trash wasn't the only thing that they put there, though. They also put the bodies of dead criminals there to decompose and be burned and consumed, okay? So you have to understand that when Jesus is teaching about what the ultimate destiny is for those who do not follow him, for those who do not belong to God, he borrowed this image of the Valley of Hinnom or this place called Gehenna, okay? Now let's see what it is that Jesus teaches us about that, okay? We're gonna start by going to Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine, he's going to use this and he says it's gonna start in verse 42. Mark 9, 42 Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him for the heavy millstone hung around his neck and cast... Oh, sorry, not 42. Let's jump down to 47. I couldn't read my writing. That makes more sense. Okay. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That word hell, Gehenna. It's better for you to be cast into Gehenna then have one of those, you know, cause one of those to stumble, okay? I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 10. A little bit more teaching about this. Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse uh, 28. Do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell, in Gehenna. Okay, this is not Hades. This is Gehenna. Now, we think, when we read that verse, we might think, oh, who's able to destroy body and soul in hell? Oh, that must be Satan, because we've seen the, the pictures, you know, the cartoons and stuff where Satan's like ruling over hell with his pitchfork and he's ready to go around poking everybody, right? That's, that's cartoons. That's fiction. What does the scripture say about it? Okay, look at Matthew chapter 25. Let's go over a few chapters here. Matthew 25, and I think we're going to be in verse uh, 41. Is that right? Yes. Okay, it says, uh, no, that's not re- us, chapter 26, sorry. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Why did God make Gehenna? Why would God make a place like that? It's for Satan to be punished. It's a place for him. It was not originally designed for people. It was designed for Satan. He is a captive. He will be a captive there. He will not be the the prison warden. He's going to be one suffering as well. Now, Revelation 20, verse 10, it just puts a real fine point on it. Revelation 20, 10. Sorry, the screens go a lot faster than I do, so it takes me a second to flip to these. All right? And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then if you go to verse 15, it says... If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a place of conscious, uh, tangible, burning torment that never, never, never ends. I'm sure we've all burned ourselves at one point or another. Put our hand under a fire, touch something hot. What's our immediate reaction? We withdraw ouch, that hurts. I need some relief from this. Can you imagine just holding your hand on the stove and not being able to take it away? It's your whole body and you know there is no relief ever coming. That's what hell is. Hades is bad enough. Gehenna is the destiny of any who do not know Jesus. Now, why do we spend so much time talking about this? Okay, It's because of the fact that you saw in the diagram, there's that split at the tombstone, and you get the two paths. There are no cross streets, there are no U-turns, there are no do-overs. When we talk about in Hebrews, okay, these foundational doctrines of resurrection and eternal judgment, this is what we're talking about. This opportunity that we have to turn our lives over to Jesus is one of those things you've seen on infomercials. Limited time only. You've got to act now. You do with this one because there will be no chance after you take your last breath. Some of you will have 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more left and before your moment comes, whether Jesus comes back or you die. Others of us, it might be days, hours, or even minutes. We don't know when it is. So what do we need to do? We need to act now. You need to act now for your salvation. If you are not absolutely sure Jesus has paid the price for my sins, make today the day that you come to him and say, God, forgive me, take me. I want a new life in you. But also, we should have just as much of a degree of urgency those of us who have already been saved, that we are already committed to that top path because Jesus has paid the price for our sins. Do you know people that are not on that top path yet? Do you know those who have not made that decision? We need to have that kind of urgency where God will grip our hearts to make sure that we are witnessing and telling them this truth as well. Part of that is also understanding that we need to live in light of the fact that we're going to stand before the Bema Seat of Christ. Sharing the gospel with others and whatever sacrifices it takes to make that happen that's something that is going to be rewarded as well. I'm going to ask our worship team to go ahead and come up to prepare to lead us in our closing song. But as they are doing so, I want to pray and ask God to do a work that only he can do. Because you or I can share this message. We can tell other people. We can go We can do, we can say, but only God can change a heart. It is only the grace of God that rescues people. And so what I want to do is I want to pray right now that God will do his supernatural work in us right here and now. All right? So I'm going to pray, and then we'll sing our closing song. All right, so would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for the truth of your word. It's not all in one spot. We've got to kind of piece it together from different places, but it is very, very clear that it is appointed unto man and woman, to humanity. Each person dies once, and after that, there comes a judgment. Lord God, I pray that this foundational doctrine would be laid firmly in our lives. And Lord, if there is anyone present here 
listening online, listening later, that does not yet know you. Lord, I pray for the, um, the powerful, pressing work of your Holy Spirit to just poke at their hearts, to grab hold of their shoulders, shake them if need be. They realize they need you. They need that new life. But Lord, I also pray too, equally, for those who have already received that new life. Some of us need to be shaken up too and say, it's time to start telling people. We can't hold this message back because yes, heaven is for eternity, but so is hell. So Lord, I pray that you would drive this message home to us and that you would do that work that only your Holy Spirit can. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.